not a little God made in the image of man. You're high and exalted. You're the king above all. Your scepter stretches to the furthest galaxy. The most distant star, the smallest island, the hardest heart is touched by your scepter. There's no king like you. You're so worthy that everything that has breath should sing your songs of praise. Every heart on earth should be bowed before your throne. Your worthiness draws the praise of the nations of the earth and draws our praises with full hearts. You are worthy, high and exalted one. You are worthy. You are, you are, and, and the train of your robe fills this gathering of your people you call your temple. Oh, Father, the robes of majesty that carry your name, King of kings and Lord of lords, we welcome, Lord, welcome the robe of your glorious, magnificent, kingly presence filling our lives here. Father, yes, we receive the virtue, we receive the, the fullness, we receive the shining that comes from your presence. You fill our lives, you fill this place. You're not a God distant, you're here and you're here enthroned. You're here glorious, you're here merciful and compassionate. You're here ready to bless, to form us, to change us. We welcome all that you want to say and do in our lives. In Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, this hour, firstly, it's, it's great to be at Springhead Park House with you all, and, and thank you for wonderful hospitality. And look, the sun has come out again. <laughs> um, really great to be able to just identify but with this important center of of ministry and and with the lives of many of you that we're having contact with some of you we saw at Bullstrode uh, some not but it's nice to have the further contact with you uh, the um, by the way we are still with WEC we spent 26 years with work in Thailand and we're back in South Africa connected to work sending base in South Africa but released into the wider itinerant ministry of wingspan prayer equipping. Uh, the idea is in this hour or what's left of it to just do an overview. Um, this is going to be interesting because three sessions at Bullstrode crunched into one hour uh, so it's going to be expressed but I hope I, won't, I, don't, I don't mean that speed-wise, I hope, uh, but it simply means that there are a bunch of stations we won't be able to stop at. We, we just have to go right through. And uh, then we'll break for coffee and, and come back <laughs> for a, a session on uh, praying prayers of petition, how to build a case before the Lord. Then we'll have uh, some lunch, I think. Yeah? And... Um, and then we're going to look at uh, how to use the scripture in praying for nations. So the overview, uh, the, the, the areas that we touched on at the conference last week were um, the, the importance of, of using the scripture in praying and different ways we can do that. And we looked at, at two of them. See, when, uh, when, when God set Israel up, he, when he created them, he set them up to be a kind of a signboard uh, for all of history. And he would display through the nation of Israel characteristics that 
uh, he would be looking for in a nation that was a nation in relationship with God. And that would, <coughs> that would carry a message through history. These are the things that stir God. These are the things that please God. Uh, this is what a people should look like if they walk in his light and before his face. And you know, they did it sometimes and other times they didn't. But the idea was it was a signboard in history and it was pointing to the time where whatever was, was seen in Israel would be uh, amplified many times over in the new nation of God on earth, the new covenant uh, Israel, the, 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 um, the new nation, holy nation of God, the church on earth. And one of the foundational characteristics God wanted Israel to model was a people that lived in complete dependency on the words that he speaks. So he said to them way early in their, in their giving them their constitution as a nation, God said that um, you're not just going to, this is in Deuteronomy 8, verse 2 and 3, he says you're not just going to live by bread, man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And you know, Jesus grabbed hold of that in Matthew 4.4 4, when he was tempted by Satan. But God wanted Israel to understand they have to live in this constant dependency, not just on physical food, but constantly dependent on the words that were coming from him. But it was more than that. It, was, it wasn't just that God wanted them to uh, admit or accept that there was a, a dependency on. God wanted them to go to another level and make the choice to live with, uh, to have a life's devotion to his word. So it wasn't just about, I mean, imagine if you just ate three meals a day because you were dependent on it, and that's all. And there was no element of enjoyment in it. No real desire for it. So you just pop a pill for breakfast and a pop a pill for lunch and, a, and, a, and an evening meal pill. And you just do it because if you don't do it, you're going to die. You just need to keep the engine running. So, but, but that would be boredom, wouldn't it? God didn't just want people to say, I better get into his word, I better hear his word and steward his word and honor his word because if I don't, uh, I don't have a complete quality of life. He wanted, the, he wanted an element of, of devotion that came out of romance. And so he said in Deuteronomy 6, he said, uh, he said the words that I speak to you, you've got to, you've got to let them sink into your heart and then you've got to impress them on your children and when, you, when you're in your home, just talk about them. When you walk down the road, talk about them. Write them on your house doors and on the gateposts. So this constant rehearsing of the words of God. So they were being schooled by God to do all of their living to the sounds of his words. And it wasn't a religious duty, it wasn't meant to be. It became that, but it wasn't meant to be. It was meant to flow out of a relationship of romance. So he starts that passage in Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, verse 4. He says, <clears throat> Hear, O Israel, Lord, O God, is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. And it's out of that relationship of love with, to God that this thing about a devotion to his words comes. It's not a religious duty. But it flows, and it's in the framework of romance. I'm in love with him, he's in love with me, and so I want to hear the, I want to hear the sound of his voice, and I want to, I want to respond to the things he's saying. So it, 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 it flows through all of their living, the words of God. As a result, when they, when they spoke to God, the, the communication between them and God, the exchange going on, the main currency in that exchange was the words of God. God would speak to them his words, they would receive his words, meditate on his words, rehearse his words, and speak his words back to him. And that was the, that was the, uh, the heart of the, of the praying. Now, that's how Jesus grew up. That, that's the way he grew up praying. He grew up uh, praying, learning how to pray and, and, and engage the Father using his own words. And the disciples grew up that way. The early church knew that, how, to, how to do that kind of praying. As we moved along in history, unfortunately as the church we've lost something of that treasure. And uh, our praying tends to be more cerebral, more from our own mind than it is prayer that is influenced by the words of God. And, and it, to me, it seems, as we look at the, uh, the momentum increasing in the prayer movement on earth, there's never been as strong a movement of prayer on earth as we're seeing currently. Uh, it, it seems that God has a passion to restore us back to the place of deep love for what he has said and is saying, 
and allowing it to influence the way we're praying. So Colossians 3, 16 and 17, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart unto the Lord. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of Jesus Christ, giving thanks to the Father. So allowing the words of Christ uh, to take ownership of our lives in such a way that affects the way that we interact with God in worship and in, in praying. There are... Um, the, 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 what starts as discipline, I don't believe it's meant to stay as, as discipline. And, and again, I repeat, it's in the framework of romance. It's not religious discipline. It's, it's discipline within the framework of romance. We choose to discipline ourselves to, uh, to a, a heart that is rehearsing the words of God and then using these words as we interact with God. We choose that discipline in order to cultivate habits. And the habits are there in order to help build us into the kind of people we believe God wants us to be. And, uh, and learning those disciplines and habits of praying the words of God back to Him helps our prayers, increases the accuracy of our prayer. We find we're less likely to be praying from our own thoughts and from the circumstances, allowing circumstances to dictate what we should pray and we're more likely to be praying from the thoughts of God. Uh, so it increases our accuracy in praying. It increases, it, it, um, increases our uh, uh, purity, in, in the purity of our praying. Uh, drawing God's word into our praying um, does give our praying um, a perfect cutting edge. Because Hebrews 6 verse 17, 18 says that, that uh, the word of God is the sword of the Spirit. That's a perfect cutting edge. It doesn't come sharper than that. The Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. And when we use that in prayer, which is what the next verse says, take the sword of the Spirit, Word of God, praying, at praying, praying in the Spirit with all kinds of prayers. And it gives our praying a penetrating uh, cutting edge. There are different ways we can, we can um, pray Scripture or use Scripture to pray. We can, um, we can simply... Pray the prayers that are in the Bible. And there are many of them. So we can search through the Psalms as a beautiful book to, uh, to habitually uh, just... I, I try to constantly just keep soaking in the Psalms every day. Read, read a couple of Psalms. Um, and, uh, and, and, and take on some of the prayers that were prayed there. Praying them back to God. There's no copyright on them. You can use them. <laughs> take some of the prayers of the prophets. Pray them back to God. The prayers of Jesus, pray them back. Just read them, pray them back to the Lord. The, the prayers of, of the apostles, apostolic prayers, some tremendously meaningful and deep prayers there. The hymns of Revelation, wonderful. Revelation 4, 5, work through Revelation and take some of those hymns and, and just pray them back, sing them back to God as prayers. Uh, the... Uh, Another way is to actually use scripture when we pray topically. It's a little bit difficult to do it, but um, it's a nice exercise, both in our inner room plus when we're together praying corporately in the upper room. Where when there's a topic brought out, whether it's in praise, say for instance, we're going to, uh, we're going to just focus on the holiness of God as we worship. So your minds begin to scan the scriptures and draw passages that you know relate to the holiness of God and you draw them in and use them in your worship. Or we're going to pray for, uh, we're going to pray for the crime rate to be broken in a certain area. We're going to pray for justice in a certain area. Your mind begins to scan the scriptures and pull out references, scriptures that you, you may not be able to tell us exactly where it is. In fact, you don't even have to quote it exactly. But, but you latch on to something that was said by God concerning that issue, and you draw it in, and when you begin to speak what God has already said, there's an immediate yes in heaven. God says, I like that, I spoke it. You know, it's, it, there's an immediate agreement, and when we agree with God, it's easier to come into agreement together. Another way is to pray narrative. We'll, if we have time, we'll touch on that a bit later. And then to pray from a text. And if we can just have love that scripture or the, the one on how to script the next, um, the next file. Um, we, one of the most interesting 
and enriching experiences in praying is to take a text of scripture and allow the spirit to just open it up into what I call facets of a diamond. I like to think of, of that particular scripture, that particular, it may not be a full verse, it may be a portion of a verse or maybe a couple of verses. I try to not take too big a passage because the bigger the passage, the more multifaceted it becomes and it's really difficult then to, uh, to actually focus on anything. So, uh, you know, I'll take a verse or take a section of a verse and that's the diamond. To me, there's a truth of God coming, at, coming to me uh, that is beautiful. And, and I want to, you know why God gives us truth? God gives us truth to expose himself to us. And the reason he does that is so that he will stir a response in us back to him. The primary reason God has given us his word is not firstly so that we'll take the word and go and preach it outside and go and evangelize and go and teach. See, as important as that is, it's not the primary reason. The primary reason God reveals himself to us is, is so that it will stir in us a response back to him. And it's as we own his words, as we begin to respond to his words and, and relate to him using the truths he's spoken concerning himself, that does something inside of it. roots those truths deeply in, inside of us so we can go and share it with others and it is shared then as life. Not just a cerebral tooth that we have as academic knowledge, but it's become life to us. Uh, but, but it happens as we spend time soaking in his truth and responding to him with it. Select a text. It could be Psalm 130. Sometimes it comes as you're reading and you think, ah, that's great. I want to just camp on that and spend time responding to the Lord. Other times you actually go looking for a text that is in line with a particular focus in your worship or a particular focus in your, your prayers of, of supplication. Read it and ask yourself, what is the theme? There's the diamond aspect. What is the diamond you're seeing? Uh, the diamond is the truth theme. It's not a Bible study. There's no right or wrong. The question is, when you look at that scripture, what is the truth coming out at this particular point that the Spirit is illuminating to you and making life to you? That's your truth theme. Now, for instance, John 3.16, For God so loved the world, He gave His one and only Son, that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. Now, you can, you can have different themes coming out there. You can have a theme on faith. You can have a theme on hope. But uh, probably the primary theme, the one that the dominant theme there, is about God's love. So, that's the truth diamond you're looking at. But you know that a diamond is made up of, of segments or facets. And, and the thing about the, the segments or facet is each facet has a beauty of its own. Yeah? If you could isolate just one facet from that diamond, you'd still say, wow, that's beautiful. But each facet adds to the beauty of the whole diamond. So you don't want to forget the whole diamond. What is the truth? Well, the truth in this particular scripture, the diamond is the love of God. But then you can break down the different facets and just mark them. You know, in your Bible, I actually put a pencil slash where I see it's the end of a facet of truth. So for, for God so loved the world, I say, I'd make that as my first facet. For God so loved the world, slash. That's a facet of truth. And I know if I move beyond it, it's going to take me into the next facet with a beauty of its own. And I don't want to go there yet. I just want to camp on this beauty about uh, for God so loved the world. What that tells me is, yes, the truth theme is God's love. But that tells me in that facet, particularly, it tells me about the inclusiveness of God's love. He, he hasn't excluded anyone. It's, it's just so... I think I put them here. There we go. This is my breakdown. This is not the right. <laughs> There's no right or wrong. This is just the way it fell open to me, praying from the scripture. For God so loved the world, it's love for all, that he gave his one and only son. It's, it's about love sacrifice. And whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. It's about God's gift of life. So you can see the diamond, the truth of God's love. Use the facets then, to feed the responses to God in prayer. So we take the, um, 
For God so loved the world, and just, just camp on that, the, the amazing love for all. Now, you do to decide, when, when you pray from that, are you going to be praying prayers of praise, or prayers of thanksgiving, or prayers of adoration, or prayers of supplication? You, you can pray any of those types of prayer from that one verse. You can take, for God so loved the world, His love for all, and you can pray prayers of thanksgiving, and it becomes intensely personal. Thank you for the way that you didn't exclude me. And you included me in this display of love. It becomes, it becomes prayers of thanksgiving. You can take the same phrase, the same facet of the diamond, his love for all, you can pray prayers of praise. Now it's not so much about me, but it's about him. It's about the, the, the magnificent size of his love. It then becomes prayers of praise. Or you can go on to prayers of adoration. And it, Again, it becomes intensely personal the way that he actually made a public display at the cross of how much, how bad deeply he feels for me. Dave McMullen, this amazing love he has for me. And it becomes this, uh, this receiving of this amazing love poured out and my response of adoration to him. So it becomes prayers of adoration or prayers of supplication. Asking God to manifest, to reveal to unfold his love for the peoples of the earth or the peoples in your family, whatever. Sorry it's rushed. <laughs> you get the hang of it? Get the gist of it? Okay. Well, there we go. Prayers of thanks, prayers of praise. It's the same segments, but you can, it, it will serve all those different kinds of prayer expressions. And it's always helpful to underline what key words there are to help you, uh, they take you into a doorway, you know, and help you to uh, just enter into that, the beauty of that diamond facet, and just spend some time soaking in that aspect of the truth and responding to God. Do this in your, in your personal inner room times. Just try and, and then, when you come to upper room time, praying together, set your mind, you're going you're gonna to do this, you're going to practice this. You're going to practice it. Now, not everyone in the group may have been exposed to what you're being exposed to. But if it's life to you, just begin doing it. It'll start catching. It is contagious. When people start praying out from the truth of God's word, it begins to capture. Because generally, there is a poverty in prayer. Generally, in the body. There is a poverty in prayer. And people are stirred when they hear somebody is praying from their heart and really enjoying it. And they have a sense that it's in agreement with heaven. It resonates because we were made for this. See? The other way to pray is to pray from a narrative. I, I love it because um, they, they're, they're, usually in a story there's, there's so much happening. There's so many colors. And uh, you could take a narrative, a story, a historical event in the scripture. And you can allow the features of that story to uh, give you direction and to give you content for your praying. So what you look for in the story is you ask yourself these questions. What is the setting of the story? What is the setting? What are the significant actions that I see in the story? What is being done? What movement is there? Right. Thirdly, what significant words are being exchanged? And then, fourthly, ask yourself, what are the spiritual parallels? You're going to translate the setting, the actions, the words in that story. You're going to translate it into life, into spiritual application. Okay, with me? So, let you take, take this very well-known passage of John 12, 1 to 3. It's the passage of Mary... Uh, pouring her perfume over Jesus' feet. All know the story? Jesus, six days before Passover, Jesus arrived in Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard and ex an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Now, you firstly, ask yourself the four questions. The setting, the actions, the words, and the spiritual parallels. What is the setting? Well, the setting, it's a party in Bethany, but what is the party there for? What, what is the party celebrating? 
Their brother was dead and he's alive. It's a party celebrating resurrection. Can we relate to that? Is there a spiritual parallel? Can you translate it into our experiences? That we're not only celebrating the resurrection of Jesus, which opens up wonderful things to pray, but we're celebrating our own resurrection with Christ. And uh, there's so much to pray, but rather than just go off and each pray our own little thing, why don't we use the story there to guide us in the celebration of the resurrection miracle. So the first action you see there, what action you see Mary separating herself from the noise and the distraction and the buzz of the party. I mean, you visualize what you're seeing there in a party. You're seeing food being passed around, people just gorging themselves, talking, it's noisy, there's activity, there's so much distraction. There's this one lady who chooses to tear herself away from all of that, and she's just got her face, her eyes fixed on one, and that's Jesus. She just wants to be where he is. And she pulls herself away. And that gives us something to pray about. Lord, we choose, to let, we choose to let what we have seen of you and know of you to become louder in our lives and the buzz and distractions. And we choose this time to separate ourselves and just come and draw near to you. And then she pours this expensive perfume. And there's a spiritual parallel there where there's this display of extravagant love. Lord, I just I want to hold nothing back from you. Nothing at all. I don't want to keep part of it for myself. I just give it all to you. The sacrificial love because I reckon, Lord, that you're worth more than all that I can give and far more than that. And then there she wipes his feet with her hair. That's the next significant action. And you see this picture of love, self-denying, uh, not really concerned about what people think. Just letting her hair down and wiping her feet. And, and this, 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 this truth of, of wanting to display our love to Him, whatever it costs, doesn't matter. Now, have a foolish way may seem to other people, doesn't matter. I just want to serve him with all my heart and display how much I love him. And then this final bit that says the whole house is filled with fragrance. Uh, it's not a secret love affair. And Lord, I declare that. I don't, I don't want my, my love with, with you, my romance, to be a secret thing. Just between you and me. I want the entire world to know this is alive. This is real. See? So no significant words. You, you catch some of it further on, but in that passage in the portion we looked at there were no significant words but you get the setting and you get the action and just spend time on it and allow allow the setting and the action and if there are any key words allow them to give some direction to what we're focusing what what we're praying and then feed you content make the spiritual translations okay praying praying in the upper room praying corporately is going to take us to levels of power that none of us can reach individually in our inner rooms. That doesn't cancel out the inner room. It just makes the inner room far more important because the upper room can only really be accessed and enjoyed as an exchange of life together when we are having a personal inner room life journey, where the inner room is not, not something we just hold as a doctrinal truth, but we're actually experiencing what Jesus talked about, the shut door times, where we have a personal prayer experience. And from that, it goes up into the upper room, and we begin to feed into the rich, the rich experience uh, of, of others coming from the inner rooms and praying together. Uh, what happens is, um, when we're praying together, uh, there are two things that make up prayer strength in the upper room. The one is authority and the other is power. Authority is a God-given license to access heaven and influence earth. That's a God-given license. That's ours in Christ Jesus. Power is the might of God working through his people in terms of the license that he's given us. Okay? He's not going to work outside of the frame of the license. It's in the frame of the license, the authority to access heaven and influence earth. His might is going to work through us. That's power. So you've got authority and power. 
When we are in the inner room, just one solitary prayer, James 5 tells us the prayer of the righteous person is effective, right? The working strength of one righteous person is, very, is, is effective. What happens when you have five, ten, twenty of these righteous people in Christ leave their inner rooms and they come up and meet in an upper room and say, let's pray together? What happens? Nothing happens to authority. Authority is the same. I like the, I like the illustration of a policeman, fully uniformed, carrying the badge. Right. He has exactly the same amount of authority as a group of 100 policemen, all uniformed and carrying the badge. The authority is exactly the same. Whether it's one or whether it's 100, the authority hasn't changed. The authority is the, full go the government that they represent backs them, whether it's one or whether 100. You with me? Authority hasn't changed. What does change when the inner room prayer moves up to the upper room to meet with others, what changes is power. As soon as there's a bringing together of people who have equal authority and consolidate their authority, there's an increase of power. So again, using the policeman picture, there's no change of authority from the one to the hundred. But look at power. From one sidearm, you've got a hundred sidearms. From one semi-automatic rifle, you've got a hundred semi-automatic rifles. As soon as you consolidate the authority, it increases power. And the same is true in the praying. When the one prayer who has amazingly effective prayer strength, according to James 5, in his inner room. But when he comes with his authority and he meets with another person who has the same authority and another who has the same authority and another who has the same authority, you have 5, 10, 20, 50 in a room all having equal authority. By consolidating their authority, there's an increase of power. That, but the element is agreement. Not just the fact that they're under the same roof or in the same four walls. It's the element of agreement. That, that's, the cre that's the key thing. And um, the foundation of this is when Jesus prayed, he said in John 17, he says, Father, I'm asking for my disciples and those that will believe through them that you will make them one. And he wasn't just praying for, for oneness, but he was actually praying, he says, Father, as you and I are one, that they will be one in us. And he was actually praying that the Father would draw us, not just make us one, but actually draw us into the oneness of the Father and Son. And I, I can't even begin to, as I was saying at Bullstrode, I can't, I don't, my mind won't go there. I can't understand what that means. That we have been drawn into a oneness in the oneness of the Father and Son. But I, I do know this, that in, in, in bringing us into the oneness, that the, that the triune God has always been in, it opens up a dynamic in us that has always been there between the Father, Son, and Spirit. The dynamic of agreement. There has never been a microsecond of disagreement between the Godhead. The persons of the Godhead, never. There is agreement. In their oneness, there is a dynamic of agreement. What, what does Father want to do? Son is in perfect agreement. What does Son doing? Father is in perfect agreement all the time. Now we've been brought into that and we've been allowed this dynamic of agreement as the body of Christ on earth. One in, in the oneness of the Father and Son. Difference is Father and Son have it perfect, you know. They do it from nature. We don't. For us, it's something we're learning to do. How to move together in agreement and particularly in this area of prayer. And when we come, the, the basic thing in honoring this thing of agreement and oneness is, is to make sure that there are no walls between us. You know, we can come and get all the technique and the form and everything, praying scripture and trying to agree with heaven, but folks, if we're not in agreement with one another, relationally, uh, we, we don't, we, the authority weakens. Okay, that's why Jesus in, in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, he, he spent a large section there after the prayer saying, you have to forgive. If you don't forgive, your father's not going to forgive you. You must forgive. He says in Matthew chapter 5, he said this, there must be reconciliation before there can be acceptable offering. If you're going to offer and you recognize that something you have, somebody has against you, 
lay it down, reconcile firstly. So the first thing is to make sure there are no, there are no walls that have been raised up through anger, unforgiveness, bitterness, and just keep that clear, keep that clean, keep, keep that clean. Then we can come and pursue this amazing thing called agreement, Romans 15, verse 5 and 6, that with one heart and one mouth we may glorify our Father. That's the issue. Oneness expressing itself in agreement brings glory to the Father. Oneness expressing itself in agreement in our praying brings glory to the Father. The, uh, I, I find that the easiest way to come together in upper room praying, in group praying, and, uh, and come to a place of convergence of agreeing. You know, we come distracted. And, you know, I think in many, t many cases, particularly people in ministries, everybody has different ministries and different issues and different crises and problems and deadlines. And, and you come together distracted. Sometimes you come together just tired, mentally and physically tired. How do you converge? I find the easiest way and the most refreshing way is to come and commonly focus on the throne, the place of eternal agreement. There has never been disagreement at the throne of God. And, and as we focus on the throne, don't focus on the thing we're going to pray about, the crisis, the need, the circumstances. That's the worst way to try and build agreement, by starting there. Because for every crisis, if you have 20 people in a room, you have 20 ideas of what the solution is, of what we should ask God to do. To remedy it. The best thing is to do is move away from there and go to the place of convergence, the throne of God, and just spend unhurried time responding to who He is. What that does then is, uh, that's Hebrews 4.16, where it tells us we come to a throne of grace so we can find help in our time of need, but to not miss the point that that we're coming to a throne. So what becomes most urgent and immediate right then is not the thing we're coming for help, to ask for help for. But the thing most urgent and immediate is the reality of the throne. We're standing in front of a throne. We're sitting in front of the enthroned glorious one. So our first response, most urgent response is let's respond to his size. Let's respond to his majesty, his holiness. His amazing power, His love. Let's respond to His nature. And uh, don't feel apologetic at times when there's no time to actually bring your request to Him because you've run out of time and all you've done is respond to the throne. Uh, you know, we've had it. We're, we're, it's again and again that has happened. And you sense the, the shalom of God saying, I really enjoyed that. And, and God does what we were going to ask for anyway. Because he knew it was in our hearts to ask, but we made space to firstly just respond to him. And the level of agreement grows when we do that. Uh, we, we want to agree with God. But upper room, corporate praying, is about agreeing with him together. Okay? We want to agree with him, but we want to agree with him together. And praying scripture, as we saw earlier, whether from a narrative, from prayers that are in the Bible whether we're doing it topically and drawing scripture into it, uh, whether we're praying from a text, it helps when we know we're praying something that God said. It's easier for everyone to come into an agreement when we are praying something that God said. It's easier for us to agree with God together when we use scripture. When somebody prays in a meeting, we want to voice agreement with them. Not just think it, but actually voice agreement. So the Romans 15 passage is with one heart and mouth glorifying. So um, when somebody prays, don't switch off, don't disengage when they pray. Don't sit there composing that masterpiece you're going to pray. If only someone will be quiet long enough to allow you to say you know, don't, don't get caught into that. Listen to the truth the Spirit is bringing out in prayer through that particular person who's praying. 
Listen. As you listen, let it resonate within you. Don't listen just to the words. God is always expressing more than simply the words that we hear. Listen to the truth that is coming out. There's a difference. Yeah? It's not just the words. But what is the truth that God is bringing out through that thing, that sentence, that, that, that bit that our brother, our sister is praying? Listen and resonate with it. And it helps if you in the meeting say, yes, Lord, yes, do it audibly. Just to build that environment of agreement. Yes, Lord. Also, very practically, being audible in your agreement helps you to stay engaged and not doze off. Just, you know, be intentional about staying engaged. You know, this amen thing. It doesn't have to be amen. It can be yes, Lord. Yeah, I agree with that. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Sing a response if you want, quietly, so it doesn't interrupt the person who's trying to make themselves heard. But, but um, agree in your heart, and then when the person stops praying, and I'll come to when they stop praying, when they start praying, um, then, then it's your turn to actually pray out and voice agreement and pray in continuity. Remember the facets? So if, if somebody's praying on this facet of his love for all, don't jump into another facet that is unrelated to that one. Just move together. Why? Because we're building agreement with something God has said. It's His truth. And we want to build agreement. Otherwise, if we're not going to do the agreement thing, we may as well just go home and go into our inner rooms and do it by ourselves. But we've come together because we believe that in agreement there's a raising of the level of power. So listen to what somebody is praying and then voice agreement. Pray in continuity. Don't, in, don't hurry to introduce a new issue, a new facet, a new subject. Just pray in continuity. Put your signature onto what they just prayed. Even if it means repeating what they just said in different words. Uh, or another scripture comes to mind that is related to that, but agree. In, in a meeting, you have to, the dynamics are different. In a room, upper room, dynamics are different. In a room, you can pray as long as you want. You can just pause long enough to take a fresh breath, and then you go on again. But when you, if you do that in an upper room, two things happen. People disengage. That's a nice, that's a nice way of saying they go to sleep. People disengage. Secondly, the longer your prayer becomes, the more facets are introduced, and then people are left thinking... What do I agree with here? You know, it's just going off here and going off, oh yeah, Lord. And, and you're having a great time because you may be a person with an intercessor's heart and you just love to, once you get started, it's hard to stop. And you have to, you have to uh, discipline yourself when you come to upper room. And, and this is the thing, when we come to pray together, we have to think servanthood. You know, we, we, in missions, we think servanthood when we're reaching our target people. We want to do anything we can to win their hearts. But we really have to think servanthood in the prayer room. How can my praying best serve my brothers and sisters here? Not just serve the Lord, but how can I serve them in their praying? Well, one thing, I can listen to what's been prayed. And secondly, I can resonate and respond to what has just been prayed. So I can pray in agreement with the person that has just prayed. And keep my prayers succinct on target, so that I allow the others to then feed in and pray in agreement with what I've just prayed. Okay, Serve one another in the praying. Pray, and, and another practical thing about serving one another, being aware of one another's need to hear what I'm praying. Pray loud enough so everyone in the room can hear. I mean, you may be having such an anointed time, just you and the Lord, but it's all in your, in your collar, you know, nobody can hear. So we can't enter into that truth and express agreement. So just pray out loud enough to make sure a person in the furthest corner can hear what you've said. We want, we want praying is firstly about the pleasure of God. It's not firstly about meeting needs, seeing things happen in the earth. It's firstly about stirring God's heart. He loves to hear his people speak his name. And then begin to pour our heart out to him. It stirs his heart. It's firstly about the pleasure of God. 
But at the same time, in corporate prayer, we want to be aware of our, it's the one another mindset. How can we best pray in a way that serves my brother and sister's pray, prayer so that we can build that agreement? Okay. Um, the the uh, church, church, the church began in an upper room prayer meeting. Uh, 120 people were powerfully impacted in a prayer meeting. The spirit of promise came. The city was changed. Nations were changed. We're still talking about it today. I believe that the expectancy is that as we get into the final bit of the end of the ages and Christ is preparing the platform for his return, we can expect to see major breakthroughs of the presence and the power of God on planet earth. Strongholds being broken, seemingly impossible things happening, harvests coming in that will cause our jaws to drop and say, well, we, wow, we never thought so much could happen in such a short span of time. And, and God is going to demonstrate the fame of his name mm -hmm. on earth. But when God plans to do something significant on earth, he always sets his people praying and he prepares an environment of his people being in agreement with his heart for that to come. And if God is going to display his power and his strength in a new level on earth, he's going to set his people praying at a new level on earth. And it's going to be upper room prayer. Aim for it. Set your heart on it. Lord, teach me to pray. Not just in the inner room, but Lord, teach us to pray when we come together. How to build this thing of agreement. How to latch ourselves onto the throne and be generous in spending time responding to what we're seeing at the throne. And not to be easily moved away from that into the old ways of doing things. You know, just go back into the well-used pathways and ruts. Teach us, Lord. Take us to a new level of how to serve one another in prayer and to pray in agreement. How to pray in agreement with you because your words are becoming life to us in our praying. And agreement is growing. You know, when that happens, you find people coming to prayer meetings early and not wanting to leave. You know, you can have half night of prayer or a whole night of prayer. People say, can't be that time already. That's lovely. And it's meant to be because God said, I'm going to make them joyful in my house of prayer. There's a joy element that sustains strength and refreshes. You know, and people go away thinking, that was great. When's the next prayer gathering? Today, it's, it's so much of it is the other way. Oh, another prayer meeting. No, we don't want another prayer meeting. It's, it's the worst attended meeting of the week in most churches. Because we've lost the whole joy element. But God is restoring that. But we need to set our hearts on, Lord, would you teach us to do this? It's not just going to happen. So, Father, we, we feel like little kids facing something that is far too big for us. Matters too weighty for us. And... Uh, we just open ourselves to your Spirit. Holy Spirit, we are so, so, so dependent on you. Carry us into the level that you desire us to be living at in prayer for this page of history. Carry us there. Train us, coach us, stir us. Whatever you need to do to change us, but carry us into the level of praying that is on the Father's heart in Jesus' name for this page in history. We can't do it ourselves. We confess our absolute need of you to empower us, free us, stir up such hunger within us and carry us to where you want us to be as a house of prayer people. 
in Jesus' name. Amen.